Good afternoon. My name is Heidi Thorpe, and I've work for a government agency in Australia as a data scientist. And today I'm going to be talking to you about fuzzing and how you can use this in your testing. It's how you can use fuzzing to harden your systems, mainly against cyber attacks. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the subject What are we going to do? What is fuzzing? It is the automated generation of data for testing. For fuzzing to work best, it has to be more than just randomly generated invalid data. So for instance, you have an image classifier that you're going to train to look for horses. If you were going to use random test data, then you might have pictures of an orange or a chair, random pictures random data that you might use. You test the classifier with the orange, and you say, no, no, that orange is not a horse. You test the classifier with the chair, and you say, well, it's a bit closer, it's brown, has four legs, you can sit on it, but it definitely isn't a horse. So, then you say, okay, with fuzz testing, instead of using images of an orange and a and a chair, you would instead possibly use images of a donkey and a unicorn. A don is a donkey a horse? Well, not really, but closer than an orange. Is a unicorn a horse? Well, still not quite, but it's still closer. It's, in, it's closer to what we're expecting, but it's still unexpected data and could cause unexpected results. So what we're going to be doing is creating XML or JSON that looks almost right, but gives you substantially more edge cases than you would get using just manual testing. The objective is to come up with data that superficially looks correct, but is not. Because it is machine learning, you can automate the generation of the data and the execution of the tests. The grade of Greatest vulnerabilities, crashes, null pointer exceptions, buffer overflows. You can run thousands of tests and in this way look for more exceptions. I can't show you real client data, so what we'll be doing is we'll be using MS Word data because internally it's XML. If you take an MS Word document, you'll notice that it's a zip file and you can unzip the zip file and this is the set of data files that you get when you unzip the zip file. It's not a practical example, but it's a demonstration of fuzzing and how to generate XML with the added advantage that we can import the data back and see the result at the end. This is an example of one of the XML files from a Word document. And since many REST interfaces, portals, etc., expect XML or JSON, it's still a valid test. So what is neural fuzzing? Neural fuzzing is a technique using neural networks for fuzz testing. In this case, using neural networks to generate test data. Why is fuzzing a good idea? Well, fuzzing can save money, but it's not just about saving money. We'll start at the programming step. The programmer makes a mistake. The software then moves through the QA and test cycle. The bug is not found. The testers are not using fuzzing, but maybe they're not using enough testing. Maybe they're not using the right data. The software is released, and at some point in the future, an attacker finds the finds the bug, probably they're using fuzzing, maybe. However, they do not, however, they do find the vulnerability. They find it and attack the system. They send data to the software. 
they cause it to crash, they can then steal money, data, property, whatever they like. It could quite literally be death and destruction if an attacker crashed the software in your car. And this has actually happened, not necessarily XML, but it, it has happened to people in their car. At some point, the owner of the software realizes there's something wrong. They realize that the computer vulnerability has been found. Computer security experts are consulted, and they trace the attack back to the original bug. Now it is listed as a known vulnerability, and the vendor can fix the bug. A patch can be released, and this is the worst case scenario, and it happens all the time. A better bug life cycle would be this. Instead of an attacker finding the bug, it is found by a security expert using fuzzing. They can responsibly, discreetly disclose the vulnerability before it is found by an attacker, and it can be the vendor can apply a patch and the bug is not exploited. The best case scenario would be this one. Somebody writes a bug, the QA test team find it, the bug is fixed, and it's not part of the software release. This lowers the cost of the software and increases the satisfaction for the software users. Functional testing alongside fuzzing increases the possibility that a bug is caught before the software is released. So, how does it work? Fuzz testing involves in inputting massive amounts of random data in an attempt to make the software crash. During fuzzing, a program is executed many times, and after each execution, the result is recorded. The input is modified. Sometimes the whole data input is changed, sometimes only some of it. The modified data is then sent to the program and the result recorded, along with the input data. If the software crashes, the result can be analyzed. Otherwise, the process just continues until a failure happens. There are two types of software fuzzing techniques. Dumb fuzz testing, where the input data is randomly changed, and the reaction to the random data is observed. This does, may not provide useful results. As most applications expect the, the data to be in a particular format, the technique sh should still be employed it is, it's, as it's reasonable to expect that sometimes the software will receive this random input. The other type of um, software fuzz te testing technique is smart fuzz testing, changing specific values leveraging knowledge of the underlying format or expected behavior. In this case, the application expects input that is all numbers. For instance, a phone number. These users all abide by the rules and input numbers. Fuzz testing systematically simulates a user who does not abide by the rules. So here we have an analogy. For instance, a security guard at a party you send a message with your name. He looks on the list and sends a reply, yes or no, will you get into the party? To fuzz test this guard, you need to do something unexpected. You say, look over there, unexpected behavior. Look over there, is it valid input? It's not expected, but it's not random either. The unexpected behavior may trigger a failure. Fuzz testing systematically simulates a user who does not follow the rules and could cause a failure. A good fuzzer decides what the malformed inputs should look like and generates test cases. It then automatically ex executes the test and records any failure it needs to keep any failure. It needs to keep records of any failures so that it can be a repeatable process. The whole point of fuzzing is to find vulnerabilities in the software before anyone else does. This is important from both a security and a robustness point of view. The sheer power of having fuzzing generate test cases is that you're going to have useful test cases showing up. Now we're going to implement a long short-term memory network, a neural network. 
and this is how we're going to generate the invalid data. Specifically, I'm using recurrent neural networks and Python libraries with TensorFlow to generate new inputs. Traditional neural networks start from scratch and cannot use prior knowledge. People don't start from scratch, and every time, every time they read or hear something, they use knowledge that they have from prior experience. Recurrent neural networks are networks with loops, allowing information to flow between the layers and to persist. The most important factor with an RNN is the recurrence, the loop to the internal state, also known as the hidden layer. You just keep looking for as long as there are inputs. Consider what happens when the loop is unrolled. There is a box for each time step or input in the sequence. LSTMs are a special type of RNN, and this is what we're using in this instance. The chain reveals that recurring neural networks are related to lists and sequences. Consider when trying to predict the last word in some text. I grew up in France, but I do not speak something. Recent information implies the next word would be that of a language. But which language? We need the context of France from further back. As the gap grows between the relevant data, RNNs are unable to learn the connected information. In theory, RNNs are capable of connecting these long-term dependencies, but in practice, this is not the case. This is an example of an LSTM network. X of t is given, where t is time. Y of t is what we're trying to find, and H of t is the hidden layer. Long short-term memory networks, usually just LSTMs, are a special form of RNN. They're de designed to avoid the long-term dependency problem that RNNs have. Remembering long-term information is their default behavior. The repeating module of an RNN contains a single layer. This is the four interacting layers of an LSTM. The key to the LSTM is the cell state, the horizontal line running through the unit. The cell state runs straight down the entire chain with only some minor linear interactions. It's easy for information to just flow along it unchanged. The LSTM has the ability to forget or remember information. This is carefully regulated by the structures called gates. Gates are a way of optionally remembering or forgetting information. They're composed of a sigmoid ne neural net layer and a pointwise multiplication operation. The first step in our LSTM is to decide what information we're going to throw away from the cell state. This decision is made by the sigmoid layer, the forget gate layer. It looks at t minus one, one step in the past, and inputs a number between zero and one to decide what it's, how much it's going to forget and how much it's going to remember. A one represents completely keep, and a zero means completely forget. The cell state may, for instance, remember the name of the present subject, and when it finds a new subject, it may throw away the old subject and just remember the new one. The next step is to decide which information we're going to store in the cell state. This has two parts. First, the sigmoid layer, called the input gate, decides what value we're going to update. Next, the tan layer creates a vector of the new candidate values. This could be added to the state. In the next step, we're going to combine these two to create an update to the state. In the example of our language model, we'd want to add the name of the new subject to the cell state to replace the old one that we're forgetting. It's now time to update the old cell state 
C, minus, C of t minus 1 into the new cell state, C of t. The previous steps already decided what we're going to do. We just need to actually do it. We multiplied the old cell state by F of t, forgetting the things that we decided to forget earlier, and then we add C of t. This is the new candidate values, scaled by how much we decided to update them. In the case of the language model, this is where we actually decide what information we're forgetting or remembering. And this is the actual implementation of the previous step, where we actually implement what we're forgetting and what we're remembering. Now we're going to look at some code. And because most people are not really very good at looking at XML and deciding whether it's correct, we're going to look at some Shakespeare sonnets and we're going to generate some Shakespeare sonnets using LSTMs. So. So what we've got here is we've got the Keras model, the sequential model. We're loading some. We're loading some sonnet text. Oh, 
And what we've got to do first is turn the sonnet into sequences. And in this case, we're turning them into sequences of 10 characters. And this is what the neural network is going to use to learn. We build the model. We're using a hyperparameter called temperature, which depending on the value of it is used to predict the controller randomness. So what we've got is all of the different characters that we're using. So we have, that is our character set. And usually if you're using words, then you'd use word to vec or something that's already been trained. But in this case, we're just using characters and we're going to generate the, the sonnet one character at a time. So we have the neural network and you can see it's pretty gibberish and there's just random letters and then as it's learning, it discovers the word the. So we, we've found, found a word and we're learning a bit more and a bit more and this is just one character at a time. We're learning and then when we get to about here we say something death not to me so furlerness dimment so it's it's finding words and it's almost kind of like a sonnet and then as we go further further down here we say okay the stars of summer state, and then betreath of all two, sir, one gives and sing. And this is one character at a time, generating sonnets as it goes. And then as we get towards the end, so we say here, we've got something that actually looks kind of like Shakespeare. The brave day sunk in hideous night when I behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered o'er with white when lofty trays I see barren. And you say, well, that, that's one character at a time. And this, of course, is the code that I used for XML is exactly this code. But as you can see, with, with um, sonnets, you can actually see it doing something. But with XML, it's just that much harder. And this is exactly the same code, but instead of having the sonnet, it has some XML as input. And you can see it has gibberish, gibberish. And then as it gets towards the end, it's actually looking like real XML. And so that, is what I've used, not exactly this code, not exactly this data, but something similar. And that's how I've been generating data for testing because generating it manually just is just too hard, whereas generating it automatically generate thousands of records. And that's all, oh, thank you.